from the School of Journalism at the University of King's College. Coming to you from Windsor, Ontario. From Antigonish County. From Calgary, Alberta. From St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador. From Cape Breton, Unamagi. Lagos, Nigeria. From Coal Harbor, Nova Scotia. From Halifax, Nova Scotia. From Halifax. This is The Signal on remote. We're in the one year Bachelor of Journalism class at the University of King's College in Halifax, Nova Scotia. I'm Daryl Roberts, and although we're based in Halifax, as you just saw, we're all over the place in this year of remote and online school. But we're getting the job done anyway. Reporting on how COVID is changing life and work in our cities and towns. In this, the first of two webcasts, looking at how people in our communities have found ways to keep their jobs and businesses going during the pandemic. We begin in Halifax, where a local news and magazine shop has been a neighborhood fixture for more than 30 years. Atlantic News survived the internet and it's kept going throughout the pandemic too. Alex Guy dropped in on a busy Saturday morning. This location is home to Atlantic News, a store managed and owned by Michelle and Stephen Gerard. This Halifax institution has had its doors open since 1973. Although their main seller is magazines and newspapers, their business and its browsers weren't slowed down much by the lockdown. If people are going to be comfortable browsing, they need to, um, they need to have hand sanitizer. So, and then we adapted to, right, we can only have two people in the shop at a time. So we had a line up outside, we had a person on the door. The main reason the store is doing so well is because of prepaid copies of printed news issues, like the Saturday Globe and Mail. So with adapting, you know, we, we did what we could, and um, we did an awful lot of curbside pickup, a, a ton. And, um, and then the, the biggest thing that we had to do again, was about controlling the amount of people in the shop, was on Saturdays, we get in 450 Globe and Mail. 400 of these 450 are for prepaid subscribers. However, each one of them needs to be counted. But when it's early on Saturday, any customer can come in and have one printed for them before the original copies arrive. And there's today's paper. One takes too long. Considering sales did not decrease during the first wave, if there is a second wave, there may not be much that can keep dedicated buyers from having their paper copies of daily news. For The Signal, I'm Alex Guy in Halifax. A popular restaurant downtown Halifax is working hard to stay open in the pandemic. COVID has been rough on dining out, even with patios in the summer. And now, winter is coming. As Nathan Horn reports, the owner says he needs help. A year ago, the sidewalks in downtown Halifax would be hectic during lunch hour, with restaurants crowded. But not anymore. In fact, business is down more than half due to coronavirus at Two Doors Down. Craig Flynn owns the popular downtown restaurant and his revenues have taken a big hit. Yeah, it's 40 to 45 percent. That's very, it's, I mean, we have some weeks that it's worse. Um, there were a couple of weeks in August, perhaps, where we might have gotten up to maybe 55 percent of regular. Um, but uh, so a good day now is a fraction of what it used to be. Flynn hasn't been able to bring all of his employees back. Many have taken the pandemic as an opportunity to exit the industry or simply don't feel it's safe to return to work. And those still on the job are working harder. It's certainly been a, a challenge. Um, we have seen uh, decreased revenues and levels of business compared to what we're used to over past summers. Um, and uh, there are a lot more, obviously, cleaning procedures and things like that that have to take place day to day. Additionally, Flynn isn't convinced everything that can be done is being done. I do think that the government, particularly the Nova Scotia government, needs to be more vocal about telling people it's okay to eat out. Um, it's okay to support local business, that it's needed. 
For now, it's unclear when business will be back to normal. Flynn says he hopes by branching out into food delivery and upholding the quality of his product, he can weather this storm. With The Signal, I'm Nathan Horn in Halifax. Bad news for restaurants has been good news for a small farm in rural Nova Scotia. When people started baking at home, they needed flour. And that led the Chisholm family to start a whole new business. Rosemary Murphy has more. Sweet Mountain Farm is nestled deep in the Ohio Valley of Antigonish County. It's been in Gabe Chisholm's family for six generations. Today, they're going back to their roots and growing and milling their own heritage grains. Historically, there was a lot of grain grown around here. I mean, that being said, I'm not able to access any of that information because it's sort of like died out in my father's time. When pandemic baking took off last spring, the Chisholms decided to seize the moment. They planted a big crop of heritage wheat and ordered a small stone mill. We harvested our first crop uh, around the end of August. Um, we're producing a variable amount of flour every week. It ranges from 50 pounds to 400 pounds. We're, we're increasing our production every week, I'll put it that way, but it's still a small part of what we do. They're currently selling online and just took their flour to their first farmer's market. A local restaurant owner is one of their biggest customers. He says that having grain milled to order makes a big difference. I noticed right away when we first sampled their bread and, and made some loaves, there's a delicious deep flavor. It's, a, it's earthy and hearty and warm and it feels healthy and good to eat. You know, the things that if you were to go back and look at what people in the depression um, really uh, wanted and, and had difficulties accessing those basic things. That's kind of where we're headed um, because we want to make food. With the success of their flour, the Chisholms are thinking about adding more staple products, maybe salt or maple sugar next. For The Signal, I'm Rosemary Murphy in Antigonish County. In southwest Ontario, a butcher shop decided to branch out just before the pandemic started. They're offering vegetables and plant-based products for the first time. Ragu Para has more. After 15 years of selling meat, the owner of Mr. Meat Market decided to branch out less than a month before the country shut down. He opened a new store and included plant-based meat alternatives for the first time. Well, we didn't anticipate COVID when we adopted this, this location. This, the, the, to, to develop a new store takes years in the making. One of the main goals of the new store was to broaden the market. I, I'm in the business of retail, so we could, we could easily adopt a plant-based program, which we, we have in place. We developed that store because it was something for everybody. You know, vegan uh, diets and lifestyles have uh, ever been growing, so we want to accommodate those people as best as possible. At the same time, COVID-19 has led to supply problems for the traditional offerings. There were some shortages, partly because out west, I believe it was, there was different break um, outbreaks at plants and things, so they had to shut down. So in general, there just wasn't as much meat available to us. And on top of supply issues, there was a problem with the costs. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics and Canadian Cattlemen's Association, beef prices for consumers spiked during COVID-19. Beef prices started to skyrocket, then pork, then poultry, and went in that exact order. And prices are still high. Beef went up 25% this year. I mean, it's very ex beef is, is a premium product. Uh, it's not accessible to a lot of people. Canadians have historically been heavy meat consumers. He says, well, that's good for the economy. It's often a problem at the checkout. With uh, lentils uh, or with pulses, you kind of democratize the meat counter, I guess. You make it more accessible to more people. Shalboa says a growing population will raise demand for less expensive alternatives, and plant-based proteins are one way to bridge that gap. For The Signal, I'm Ragupara in Windsor, Ontario. Another one of our classmates files her report from Western Canada. In Calgary, a popular museum has been closed since March, even though the province lifted the COVID-19 lockdown months ago. Nicole Kusakis has the story. This is an art installation called Marking. It outlines where the original Fort Calgary building was in 1875. This is a familiar spot to me. I used to work in that building over the hill. It's the building we now call Fort Calgary. It's a popular spot, but today it's closed. 
course, uh, like all organizations like ours, in March we closed our doors to the public and immediately had to cancel all of our public programs, which is tough. Um, Grattan says there's a silver lining to the continued closure from the pandemic. We've got a really focused runway on cleaning out all of the spaces, understanding what our inventory is, retooling all of our financial processes, systems and policies, you know, doing some great work with our board on governance re renewal. So really, COVID has given us the time and space to renew every single operating aspect of the building while focusing also on the plans for the future. Those plans include tearing down and rebuilding the museum entirely. Grattan says the current exhibits are dated and speak to a kind of celebratory colonialism instead of the story that this site is known for. This site is, of course, the place where the Northwest Mounted Police arrived in 1875, but previous to that and pre-contact, it's been a place of gathering uh, for the Blackfoot Nation uh, for thousands and thousands of years. And while Fort Calgary is not ready to break ground on the new museum just yet, the pandemic offers an opportunity to clear out old clutter and put tracks down for a new future. The fort currently plans to reopen to the public in February of 2021. For The Signal, I'm Nicole Fasakis in Calgary. Back to Nova Scotia, where a zoo in Aylesford is defying all odds. They've stayed open in the pandemic, surviving with the help of the local community. Zarnagar Khan went for a visit. Here, come here. Well, not me. It's night time now? for Sturk and Naya, as Gail Rogerson feeds the lions with raw meat this sunny afternoon. See, you wouldn't even think of doing anything bad. Gail Rogerson has successfully run the Oaklawn Farm Zoo despite being hit hard by the pandemic. She attributes her success to help from local community. Get our, our feed from the feed store and the local farms around, if they have surplus, they let us know and they'll bring it here. People bought season's passes, even though our season was much shorter. There's been GoFundMe pages to make sure that we all purchased to make sure that we kept the zoo afloat. Um, buying stuff at the gift shop and stuff, like allowing the kids to get stuff at the gift shop to support the business. So we're, we're quite happy being open, but we want to follow the rules, so we stay open. It's to Yarmouth, but basically it was all local people doing stuff, and they were, they were re rediscovering the zoo again, and it worked out well. So, um, yeah, I guess our community was such a strong supporter of the zoo and it really made us flourish in a time when we didn't think we could, so, yeah. Like koi fish, Oakland Farm Zoo and its community are traveling upstream and one day hopes to come out as a winner. Zarnagar Khan, The Signal, Halifax. Nova Scotia is part of the Atlantic bubble. Travel is open among the four Atlantic provinces because COVID cases have stayed low, but a longer term health crisis, the opioid crisis, continues. Almost 100 people died in Atlantic Canada last year from overdoses. As Preet Vogel reports, a new group in Halifax is working within COVID restrictions to bring that number down. Compared to other parts of the Atlantic region, Halifax has a number of harm reduction services like a needle exchange and an overdose prevention site. It also has a strong community of current and former substance users, and Patrick Mobert is part of a group working to extend that community. He's a former substance user himself, and now he's helping to lead the Substance User Network of the Atlantic region, or SUNAR, a federally funded project to increase availability of harm reduction services across the Maritimes. So a typical day here in the in the SUNAR office would, of course, start with making of the coffee. That is the most important thing. Uh, you know, I, I joke, but it is nice to be in a room with people and to be sharing ideas and sharing sort of jokes and stories and experiences of what's going on. The idea for SUNAR started here at Direction 180, the opioid treatment program where Cindy McIsaac works. We're not going in as experts. We're by no means experts. Mm -hmm. uh, the experts are in those communities, but 
whatever we can do to help kind of mobilize some growth in those communities. So the project is still in its early stages, but sharing of knowledge, information, experiences is at the heart of the Sunar project. Like the kind of sharing that's happening here today at a workshop at Direction 180. Future plans for Sunar include a new website and regular regional meetings. For The Signal, I'm Preet Bogle in Halifax. One of the hardest parts of the pandemic has been getting stuck indoors. Amateur and professional sports slowly made their way back. In Halifax, people are back on the field and on the court. But of course, some of the rules have changed. Leo Bui explains. These volleyball players are thrilled to be back on the court. For many of them, the return to sport is more than just exercising. Yolanda Kumu is a player and an organizer for the volleyball league. She also has three children and works full time. The only nights I have, the only two hours that I have to myself, they, like, it, this is my me time. And um, I find that when I was during COVID and I was home all the time, um, my stress level was way up. So um, this is a good de-stressor for me. Um, especially working full time and then again like with my children and their activities this is the two hours that I get and I find it's great exercise I feel way better and I'm just a better mom and just better at you know everything because of this when the pandemic hit games like these were shut down for months and when they came back the organizers had to make some changes In order for this game to happen, everyone has to follow strict guidelines to ensure the safety of the players. Participants have to sign up to play, sanitize their hands, and even disinfect the balls in between games. Right now, we are still disinfecting the ball between games and stuff, so I find there's a little more to plan ahead. The strict guidelines and rules don't stop people from coming out. It's important on so many levels for your physical health, your mental health, your just socializing. I mean, once a week is really a minimum. Um, so just hoping that it stays like this. We're not. I hope we're not going back to confinement and having to do sports in your living room. That's not fun. <laughs> As government rules ease up on group gatherings, Halifax Plays has been able to serve more players. They are running games in other sports too, including soccer, ball hockey and basketball. Some even have a waiting list. But they are hoping to do more going into the future. For The Signal, I'm Leo Bui. Finally, the working day has changed for everyone during COVID, even reporters. Getting shots and interviews from a distance can be a challenge. I think we all know that. In St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador, Michael Chubbs has more. Since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic in March, social distancing measures have had considerable impacts on our day-to-day -day lives. Zach Gowdy, a journalist and video producer with CBC in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador, spoke with me about the new risks and challenges associated with social distanced reporting. Before the pandemic, you could just call a person up I want to do a story about your thing, let's meet at this place at this time, it could be their house, it was often their house. But that simplicity was replaced with new hurdles and added precautions once the COVID-19 pandemic entered the picture. And we can't do any of that anymore, no going in people's houses, no guests in the building whatsoever. But despite the new challenges he has to overcome, Zach still finds ways to bridge that gap. So, you know, you get your practical, if inelegant, tricks like everybody has seen this now the reporters with the journalism poll while common solutions like that might not be the most elegant Zach says it's become less of an issue like a shot a number of months ago or before the pandemic of like you know a regular interview and there's this poll in the shot and the microphone is whirling around because the reporters are getting tired before the pandemic someone would watch that on TV like what the hell like, is going on there like what's up with this it would just take you right out of the story now it does whoosh, it doesn't even phase the person watching because they're so used to this to this language Scott Matthews is a professor of political science at Memorial University 
He explains that journalists play a crucial role in helping citizens practice democratic control over policy. Um, it's all the more important in the context of a pandemic that we have journalists, um, you know, giving us the information that we need, the tools that we need in order to uh, you know, hold government uh, accountable. With new challenges to overcome and new risks to worry about, journalists are learning to work at a distance. And people like Matthews are saying it's more important now than ever that they do. With The Signal, I'm Michael Chubbs in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador. That's it for the first segment of The Signal on remote. We'll be back with more stories from the one year Bachelor of Journalism class at the University of King's College in Halifax, Nova Scotia. We'll find out how musicians and other performers from Atlanta, Canada and beyond are finding ways to keep making their art. I'm Simon Smith. And I'm John Warbit. On behalf of all of us, thanks for watching. See you soon.